such a great time, isn't it, to, to be together as a people and to worship together and to draw close. I was sort of thinking about the, um, the whole thing of the temple and, you know, the different places that different people got to, got to be, some sort of almost excluded, some sort of... so that we don't have to stand outside or we don't have to wait for even the invitation in one sense. But Jesus came and invited us in. And so it feels to me like a moment to, to come in. Right now. And you know, in might be um, a comparative thing because because of staff or whatever, but but a step towards a, a beautiful invitation. So why don't we just, as we come towards the end of our time of worship, just again allow ourselves to soften and you might like to close your eyes because it's a little helpful in terms of distraction. And just accept his invitation to us. Let him melt you. Let him love you. Let him choose you. You could choose him, but maybe he wants to choose you today. So here we are, Lord, to worship you, to bow down, to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Bless you guys, and uh, please be seated. Welcome to Shaw Vineyard this morning. Hey, this is your great opportunity to say hi to somebody next to you. I'm going to talk to our Facebook Live community. Uh, don't be shy crossing the room, that sort of thing, and we'll be back with you in a little while. God bless you all. So, hey, kia ora, uh, kia ora uh, koto. Um, lovely to be together with you today. I'm Vic Francis. I don't think I introduced myself. You met Olivia just now. Um, we just uh, lovely, lovely time of worship this morning. So a great opportunity, really, to be together as a church um, and worship. Uh, if she, because um, I had a little bit of admin to do while she started her announcements, just to let you know that um, next Sunday we won't be having a service here uh, at two five two Forest Hill Road, um, and that's because we've got our church camp out. Oh, excuse me, and. Um, so uh, we won't also have a Facebook Live either. But if you'd like to join us up at Parkery Holiday Camp, we would love you to be there. Saturday in particular, there's still bookings that you can make along the line, and it'd um, be, great, be great to have you there. Um, if you would be so good as to like our post on Facebook, if you're uh, literally watching it live today, or if you're um, watching it during the week, if you somehow managed to kind of figure out who we are and you're enjoying it, we'd love you to like it. Um, we're just really aware of our, our spread or our community is much wider than who we have here in church on a Sunday morning. So it's a really nice um, thing to be able to, to just be aware of and to pray for and to, to be connected with everybody, uh, um, you know, on this time. Um, so yeah, God bless you. I would love to pray for you wherever you might be. And then we'll be handing over to Paulina, who's going to be uh, leading us or is going to be speaking today. So 
Let me pray. So God, I want to thank you for each and every person, people who are here in our congregation chatting, people who were at our chapel service earlier, um, and people who are with us online. Lord, we are um, we're threaded together by bonds of, well, lots of different bonds, really, but bonds of faith and bonds of connection, even if it's only this day. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd be with us and that the message that Paulina has would be really relevant and, and uh, have, have real life in it. And, Lord, that you'd give us a, a great opportunity to connect. And for, for those by necessity who are in our Facebook whānau today, who will be watching in their ones and twos in reality, maybe alone, maybe with family, maybe with a friend or two. Just draw close, I pray. Just be with each and every one. In a sense, the richness of being together would be bestowed upon them in their own individual situation. And Lord, I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you. It's uh, lovely to be together with you. All right, everybody. All right, all right, all right. Hey, um, I didn't introduce myself, I don't think, before, but my name's Vic Francis, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be uh, the pastor here at Shaw Vineyard. Uh, we've had a beautiful chapel service this morning already, so that rhythm that we're really only introducing for the year of the first and third Sundays um, of the year, so the next one on the 17th, so that's uh, just a wonderful thing to be. We're in our season of Lent, and so this is the third week of Lent, and today Paulina, our assistant pastor, is going to be speaking to us, um, bringing the story and deepening our experience of that. So Paulina, let's give her a hand. Why don't you come up? Thank you. Beautiful introduction. Thank you, Vic. Well, kia ora, whanau. <laughs> yeah, so um, here we are, three weeks into Lent, and, and unlike Vic, if you have followed um, our messages so far, um, the whole kind of rhythm of, of the 40 days Lent period was quite significant in my childhood because it was sandwiched between a mad carnival season that just came to grow on and on and on where people just misbehaved and dressed up and it was parties, parties, parties and, and there's even a day and, and it comes like out of a historical context where people you know, kind of were quite suppressed but that like carnival season they were allowed to go wild and, and there was even a day where it was women's carnival so the women went a bit crazy one day for the women to rule. <laughs> what do you think of that? What's changed? Eh? Like, <laughs> yeah, but then, um, and then the Lent period so it was quite abrupt because suddenly the church bells that sounded joyful reading up to that period just went quite kind of solemn and clunky and we didn't hear the nice um, bells to invite us to worship. And, um, and also Lent um, in my native Germany it was actually it's actually called the the period of fasting actually that's the official name of the period we don't call it lent we call it the fasting period a little bit like the we see with the ramadan um with our muslims uh, friends and um so and of course it then it then all accumulated this somberness all accumulated in Good Friday where there was no bells and it was so miserable. And I remember as a kid crying Good Friday, having to go to church and it was awful hearing the story of Jesus dying on the cross for us, but it was quite powerful. And then of course on the Sunday we celebrate Easter. So the Lent period is, is the period where we encourage to and get an opportunity to prepare our hearts. So I'm excited that we are, as a church, as Shul Vineyard, are joining in with this rhythm and of generations long past, but also um, it's quite special that we're doing this together with, with a lot of our sister churches all across Tamaki, Makauro, from different denominations where we zoom in on the same scriptures on the same kind of topics. Um, yeah, I, today we'll be speaking on, our, we'll be exploring the way of compassion, which kind of builds on what, what Vic was talking on, which was the, uh, the way of faith and the way of sacrifice. And if you missed any of these messages, I encourage you to, to hop online and, and catch up with them because they're quite key, really, in the context of this message as well. And then the way, our series is called The Way. I just love that because the way was actually how the early Christians were called. They called themselves the followers of the way before the word Christian 
was made up by somebody. So here we go. I'm just going to launch straight into the um, story of today. Uh, the passage that we're looking at is the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which can be found in Luke 10. Once upon a time, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and was set upon by brigands. They stripped him and beat him and ran off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to, go, to be going down that road, and when he saw him, he went past on the opposite side. And so to a Levite came by that place, he saw him too and went on the opposite side. Now, when um, Matt was inviting us to put ourselves into this stories, uh, story a few, when he spoke a few weeks ago, I picked the, uh, the, the assault victim. So here I was, so he, lying in the ditch, broken, powerless, helpless, half dead, robbed of both my dignity and all my stuff. And, um, but suddenly I hear footsteps. And first, I'm even more petrified. Now what? Is this going to get worse? But then there's a glimmer of hope. But the footsteps disappear. Here I'm in silence. But a traveling Samaritan, we hear, came to where he was. When he saw him, he was filled with compassion. He came over to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Then he put him on his own beast, took him to an inn, and looked after him. The next morning he was going on his way. He gave the innkeeper two days' wages. Take care of him, he said, and on my way back I pay you whatever else you need to spend on him. So suddenly my fate changes. After a bumpy ride in and out of consciousness on this, on this animal, in absolute horrendous pain, I just find myself suddenly on a, on a mattress. I wake up on a mattress, looking at the eyes of this caring person. And the next thing I wake up, I just feel like maybe there is hope for me that I will get through this. As before, all I wanted to do is just die rather than have to live with this pain. And so various preachers have taken actually this very perspective in, the, in sermons where we are the powerless guy in the ditch, beaten up by our own sin, in need of Jesus to, to both save us and, and help us and heal us. That was a fresh take for me. As um, Makavita prayed beautifully, God in the Bible is referred to as the Father of compassion and sometimes addressed as the God of mercy. And we see that Jesus himself was moved by compassion. I like that expression, being moved by compassion, because there's something like a moving, uh, a going out of your heart towards someone, isn't there? There's a moving, being moved in, in an emotional way, and from that place of vulnerability, you're moved to action, to actually do something and to actually care for this, for people in need. And the difference between empathy and compassion then is that, that the empathy I... I feel what the other person is feeling, but the compassion is what moves me to actually do something and, and care for people. So um, I'm taking from this that compassion is actually an attitude, heart. But let's, let's have a look at some examples of how Jesus himself was moved by compassion, because he, of course, is our example for everything, and how beautiful that he only did as what the Father was doing and demonstrated to us how, how we should live. So Jesus was moved by compassion with the crowd 
as they seemed like sheep without a shepherd, and that is just before he started feeding the 5,000. Interesting, isn't it? He was moved to com by compassion with the crowd as they seemed like sheep without a shepherd. They weren't just hungry. They needed guidance, didn't they? They needed a shepherd. He, got moved, he was moved by compassion before healing the sick, before healing or before raising back to life his friend Lazarus. And in that passage, we see the empathy side as well as Jesus wept. But the rhythm of, of Jesus' life, we've learned, was that he withdrew often to spend time alone with the Father. He spent time on his knees to discern the will of the Father, to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. What then is, is our response to need? There is a lot of things, and the thing is that we have to, if we want to, um, we have to quickly figure out what, was, what we've got to do, don't we, when we see need? And um, so there's just a few things that, that may go through our heads. And that is, is it safe? What will it cost me? What can I do anyway? I'm doing enough already. I am too busy, too tired. My health, my family needs to be my priority. It's their own fault that they've gotten into this trouble. Now, of course, we need to consider the cost of helping of caring, don't we? And, um, and, and one of them is the cost to our own safety. And um, Gavin De Becker, who he's an expert in, in safety, he wrote this amazing book, The Gift of Fear. I, I really highly recommend it. It's so interesting. But what he says is, is this, to be able to keep ourselves or others safe from violence, so that's the context, am I safe from violence or whatever else? We must see the other as being human, like me. That person I'm now scared of is human, like me. And it's by recognizing the sameness of their fears, of their needs, of their need of acceptance, of their hatred of being, being humiliated in public, or whatever it may be, of having hope by putting ourselves into their shoes, we can actually intuit what they, were gonna, gonna, what they were going to do next. And this is advice from somebody who's advisor to presidents in the States. He's helping actors that are being stalked and, and people in, in domestic situations or whatever. And this is his key message, that we need to see the humanity in the other. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? And then, speaking of one more thing about, about the cost, is that let's go back to that story of the Good Samaritan and the super generous Samaritan who helped. Had you realized that his help went only as far as to get the beaten up guy back on their feet? He didn't invite him to live with him. He didn't give up everything else that he was doing. He was still going on his journey and asked someone else to care, or, and then he provided. Now, for us to then find the way of compassion, I suggest that we slow down a bit. How am I going to intuit what the other person is doing if I don't slow down a bit? How do I even see the person with all my rushing? How am I going to hear what Jesus wants me to do and abide in the Father like Jesus told us to, to abide in him? How am I going to do that if I'm rushing around? And then another challenge is I think that we need to re-examine our view of success. And I'm just as guilty as, as anybody. It's very tempting in this kind of society to just be driven and driven and driven by what we call success, which is often performance. And we do need, I think, to find a real motivation for 
running or for helping, but especially for just running to the other side. But then it also, this makes me think of, some people just seem to just be so attuned to this way of compassion, don't they? And it makes me think of Hannah, who we, who's just gone off um, on, on a mission journey with the Mercy Ships. And isn't it wonderful that we kind of have confide on her gift of compassion, on this mercy gift that she has, and, and help her do what only she can do. But these compassionate types, these people with the mercy gift, they do need to realize, they need to be, be careful that they're not going to be sucked into being manipulated or doing what maybe somebody else should be doing. There needs to be something left for us to do. Otherwise, we can all go home and just rely on, on the caring types that you see in, in nursing and, and other professions. But I think that, that when you and me, when we feel compelled to help, when you, you become aware of a suffering, if you just think of a time where you helped somebody, you just, somehow you just knew that you needed to do something. You were grabbed, weren't you? You were moved by compassion. And that sort of thing can happen quite naturally. And I think it does happen quite naturally. And it, it's, it also feels right. And I think that for those of us who can find it a little bit difficult, and if you do need like a little barometer in terms of how your compassion levels are going, just think about how you're speaking with your loved ones or how are you thinking in your car. I'm afraid I was very guilty of that this morning on my rush here. I just thought, really? Do I need to slow to an absolute halt to an actual spot? because you don't know what you're doing. And it happened again and again, and then suddenly you have to go 30 when in the 50 area and stuff like that, and I was thinking, oh, I didn't have much compassion for these people. So it's, it's a good time to remind yourself to, um, uh, yeah, to do a bit of self-reflection now and then. And, and I'm sure I'm not alone, am I? Like, <laughs> yeah. But I, I do myself, I'm preparing... In preparing for this message, I actually was reminded of a time where I was in my early 20s, I was living in Munich, and I was actually moved to compassion to help somebody that was half dead. There's a lot of parallels with the Good Samaritan story. And interestingly, because it was literally, I honestly, I thought he was dead. And I just thought, why, why isn't anybody stopping? And I just couldn't help but go. And um, yeah. However, there's, as I've said, I think there's people also that, that I myself would consider and treat with contempt. But interestingly, that time where I helped because I just couldn't help myself, I just couldn't not help, I was actually not following Jesus in that time. And I find that non-Christians have a lot to offer us, don't they, in their way of compassion. But I love God's promise in Ezekiel where he says, I create in you a new heart and create a right spirit within you. I remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's amazing, isn't it? that grace. So really, I guess we're learning compassion out of our life experiences. And I'm sorry to say often out of suffering. Suffering of a loved one or your own. But I'd like to take us back to the um, our passage, the story of the Good Samaritan. Because as Jesus was telling the story, I think it's important to know, to know the context or, or to just be reminded of it. And there's only 
three more verses added to this that changes everything, the context of this. And um, so we need to see who he was actually speaking to and why, Jesus. And, and Matt, the other week, was referring, he's actually a lawyer, funny enough. He was referring to, a self, to the self-righteous lawyer. He explained that Jesus was referring to the self-righteous lawyer, which, which Matt isn't. So the question that this lawyer asked Jesus was in the context of eternal life. He was saying this, what should I do to inherit the life of the coming age? And then Jesus threw the question back, straight back at him, you probably know this story, and asked him, well, what does the law say? Because he was a lawyer, well, why is he asking Jesus this question? He just knows already. And sure, he smugly replied, oh yeah, I love you, Lord your God, with all your heart and your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and then Jesus says, yep, do that, and you will live. Simple. But the lawyer wouldn't let go. He just, so Jesus was actually saying, well said, do that, and you will live. Ah, said the lawyer, wanting to win the point, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus rose to the challenge. And that's when he told, made up this story of the Good Samaritan. That's the context. So he tells the story, Jesus. And then he, so he finishes the story of the Good Samaritan taking care of the half-dead person. And Jesus is asking, which of these three do you think turned out to be the neighbor of the man who was set upon by the brigands? You see how I twisted the question around? And the reply was, the one who showed mercy to him. Well, Jesus said to him, you go and do the same. So that was the context. And the interesting thing is, the Pharisees hated Samaritans. They, they were their enemy. They looked down on priests. So in that context, the lawyer would have expected, as Jesus was telling the story, oh, yeah, the priest crossed to the, crossed to the other side and didn't help. He would just think, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, priests, they, but us guys, the Pharisees, I, which certainly it's going to be Pharisee that jumps in and comes to the rescue. But no, it's his worst enemy, the Samaritan, that goes to help. And you can see that the lawyer doesn't, can't even say the words. Samaritan. And I think he'll be turning in his grave if he knew that we are calling anybody caring the good Samaritan. So Jesus, as he's, um, Jesus really, oh, I'm going to read this to get this right. Jesus exposed the prejudice and the hatred of the expert of the Lord's heart. And therefore, his actual lack of of obedience to the commandment. He knew the commandment, but he had his own little version. He had his own little systems that it would fit in. And in essence, in essence, Jesus is saying is, neighbor can no longer be defined in limiting terms. So in Jude 1, 18 to 23, we read, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show compassion. And suddenly this whole thing becomes much bigger, doesn't it? It's also about salvation.
Tim Wright speaking to this passage of the good of the story of the Good Samaritan sums it up nicely as he's saying the question now as then is whether we will use all that Jesus is telling us about love and grace as a call to extend that love and grace to the whole world. He goes on to say, no church, no Christian can remain content with living life in a way that allows us to watch most of the world lying half dead in the world and pass by. In closing, the key for us then is to go and do likewise, isn't it? We're going to enter in a time of communion. Um, I'd like to invite you to come up and, and grab your juice and, and bread and um, go back to your seats. And, um, and while you're waiting, um, we're going to eat and drink together. While you're waiting, I would like you to take that time to just reflect and respond to what is Jesus saying to you? And it could have been something that came to mind during the worship. It could have been something that came to mind when, as Vic was praying about the softening of heart. It could have been just a thought or an or impression. It could be something in the story of the Good Samaritan that touched you. Please take the time to respond. So please do come up and I'll, I'll wait for you to go and sit down. Before we um, take communion together, I'd just like to share my response in a brief spoken word. And I don't want this to stop you from your own reflection time, so feel free to zone out or not, or to listen, and then we'll take communion together. And um, after that, I would really encourage and, like, I'll, I'll pray for us, and then I will, I'd really like to encourage us all to just come come up for prayer if you have a need, if there's anything that resonated or you came with a need before you heard anything this morning. Let, let Jesus touch you. Let or let be moved by compassion to pray for somebody up here or in your seat. His presence is here. Thank you, people. Beautiful worship this morning. So... Here it goes. Go and do likewise. The words of Jesus taking hold of me. Am I the neighbor who sees moving closer or, and allows what she sees to move her? Or do I turn my gaze in ways to keep clean? Your eyes, Jesus, behold me. Undeservedly I find but love and compassion. Hold me safely. Move me with empathy. Clothe me, let you move me to my knees. My heart breaks for the broken and now cease. And from there I go and do likewise. Let's eat and drink. I feel that God is saying to all of us, be still and know that I am God. Be still, quiet in your heart. Before me, don't be afraid of the emotional response that can come. And don't be afraid there isn't an emotional response. And it's just something you need to sit with and maybe practice.
So I'm going to close the same prayer that um, we started this morning. We praise you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Who comforts us all in our troubles so that we can show compassion to those in any trouble, in any trouble, to those in any trouble. With the compassion we ourselves receive from God.